In this screencast, we will be discussing the imaging evaluation of patients presenting with pelvic pain, comma, specifically reproductive age females. Information is taken from the ACR appropriateness criteria. At the end of this screencast, you should be able to categorize pelvic pain in reproductive age women and then recommend the appropriate initial and follow-up imaging modality based on the presentation of pain. We'll start by discussing the importance of determining pregnancy status before imaging women presenting with pelvic pain, and then we'll describe the different modalities, ultrasound, MRI, and CT, and their usefulness in evaluating patients with pelvic pain. Pelvic pain often comes along with a nonspecific set of signs or symptoms. So patients come in with pelvic pain or abdominal pain, they often feel nauseous, may have associated vomiting or bloating, and commonly they'll have leukocytosis or fever when there is some pathology underlying the pelvic pain. It's very important to get a thorough history and physical when somebody comes in with pelvic pain. And the main reason a history and physical is important is you need to differentiate between potential gynecologic causes of pain and non-gynecologic causes of pain because you're going to evaluate gynecologic and non-gynecologic etiologies with different imaging modalities. Also essential to the workup is establishing pregnancy status, and I recommend a beta HCG. In fact, the vast majority of times in the ER when a patient says, oh, I'm not pregnant, I can't be pregnant, or gives excuses for why a beta HCG is unnecessary, that patient turns out to be pregnant. Let's talk about gynecologic causes of pain. So first, the beta HCG is important because pregnancy-related causes of pain can be different than non-pregnancy-related causes of pain. So a pregnant patient presenting with pain the things that you are trying to evaluate for are ectopic pregnancy, spontaneous abortion, placental abruption, or the onset of labor. In non-pregnant patients, you have a different set of etiologies that commonly cause pelvic pain. So hemorrhagic cysts or ruptured corpus luteal cysts are very common etiologies for pain. And then less common etiologies would include pelvic inflammatory disease, or ovarian torsion, which is the most emergent thing that you do not want to miss when evaluating a patient presenting with pelvic pain. On the right-hand side of this image, we can see an MRI showing an ectopic pregnancy. And below that, you can see an MRI of a tubo ovarian abscess. When we think about non-gynecologic causes of pelvic pain, we're mostly focused on either GI causes or urinary causes. And again, trying to differentiate those can help you focus your imaging evaluation, but in general, the imaging evaluation for gastrointestinal and urinary etiologies will be very similar. You can see on the right-hand side of your screen a CT showing an inflamed, dilated appendix with some stranding in a patient who had appendicitis. And below that, we see ultrasound imaging of the left kidney showing hydronephrosis and then an image of the distal left ureter where we see the obstructing stone. We will now break our imaging algorithm down into four basic categories, positive or negative beta HCG and gynecologic pathology suspected versus GI or urologic pathology. If there's a positive beta HCG and you suspect gynecologic pathology, then a transabdominal and transvaginal ultrasound with Doppler is the initial imaging modality of choice. This is going to assess for ectopic pregnancy. It can look for spontaneous abortion or fetal demise. It can look at placental disruption, and it can often detect ovarian torsion. Now, if you get an ultrasound and it is positive, but it's indeterminate, such as the case when there is a mass or lesion in the ovary that is not fully characterized with ultrasound, an MRI without contrast can be very helpful to add specificity to your diagnosis and determine what is wrong, particularly when there's an abnormality of the ovary, but often when there's abnormal placentation or other abnormalities of the fetus. In this image on the right-hand side, we see a classic ring of fire sign surrounding a mass in the left ovary. 
and this turned out to be an ectopic pregnancy. If you have a negative beta HCG, meaning you're not pregnant and you suspect gynecologic pathology, you're still going to start with a transabdominal and transvaginal ultrasound with Doppler. So, in general, suspected gynecologic pathology, you initiate your imaging workup with an ultrasound. This ultrasound can look for hemorrhagic cysts, PID, and can assess for torsion. Again, if your ultrasound is positive, but has an indeterminate finding or something that's not fully characterized with ultrasound, MRI without and with contrast can be helpful. So unlike in a pregnant patient, you're going to now add contrast to your MRI. We don't use contrast in pregnant women because of the unknown risks of gadolinium contrast to the fetus. You can also consider using a CT of the abdomen and pelvis with contrast if your ultrasound is indeterminate. And oftentimes in the ER, when there's a negative or indeterminate ultrasound, a CT of the abdomen and pelvis is ordered, although I believe we're using CT of the abdomen and pelvis a little too often in reproductive age females with suspected gynecologic pathology. If the patient has a positive beta HCG and you suspect a GI pathology or pathology of the urinary tract, then you may start with an ultrasound to evaluate the fetus and make sure you're not missing something catastrophic like torsion, but really an MRI without contrast is your study of choice. An MRI without contrast has a high specificity for appendicitis, diverticulitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and intraabdominal abscesses. And that encompasses a large range of the most common pathologies. It also has a very high sensitivity for hydronephrosis, but unfortunately it's not very good at identifying calculi, so you may be stuck with a diagnostic dilemma of whether this is hydronephrosis of pregnancy, where the uterus is compressing the ureter and causing hydronephrosis, versus an obstructing distal stone. If you do suspect a distal ureteral calculus and you think it's something that's going to require intervention or the patient may have signs or symptoms of pyelonephritis and you need to know if urology needs to have a surgical intervention in a pregnant patient, you can consider a very low dose CT without contrast. We have new techniques and new scanners that can minimize the radiation exposure to the fetus, get the dose very low and still detect stones. We will use CT of the abdomen and pelvis with contrast in pregnant women, but we tend to reserve this for patients who present in extremis with hemodynamic instability or patients who have had severe trauma such as an unrestrained driver in a motor vehicle collision. If you have a patient that comes in with pelvic pain and they're not pregnant, and you suspect that the origin of their pain is gynecologic or urologic, a CT abdomen and pelvis with contrast is the best study. It's going to find a broad range of GI etiologies. It's also going to do a good job evaluating the urinary tract. And while you may miss small calculi by using contrast, it's not common to miss any clinically significant calculi in the setting of contrast. If the CT is indeterminate, meaning you see some sort of gynecologic pathology like an ovarian mass, abnormal uterus, or hydrosalpinx, you may consider going to an ultrasound or an MRI because an ultrasound or MRI really do a better job characterizing the gynecologic structures and provide a much higher specificity for gynecologic pathology. So if you suspect it wrong and it does come back as gynecologic in origin, get an ultrasound or an MRI. One entity that I really want to emphasize, that I want to increase awareness of, it's almost my personal mission, is Mittelschmerz, or the pain associated with a ruptured corpus luteal cyst. So there were studies a long time ago that showed that women have mid-cycle pain associated with ovulation. So it's unclear whether it's the stretch of the capsule right before ovulation, the rupture of the cyst resulting in ovulation, or it's the small amount of blood that can get in the pelvis from the rupture of the cyst. Whatever it is, many, many women have pain with ovulation. Mid-cycle pain, very common, often recurs. On CT and MRI, we can diagnose it very easily. We see a 
ruptured corpus luteal cyst in the ovary, and often see a little bit of blood in the pelvis. We can also diagnose it on ultrasound very effectively. I think this is an under-recognized etiology for pelvic pain. I believe it's one of the most common reasons we're getting CTs of the abdomen and pelvis in reproductive age females in the ER. And I hope that if it's recognized and people attribute the pain that patients are coming in with, which is real pain, to this, they can provide reassurance to the patient so that the next time they experience similar pain, they don't come back in and get another CT scan. Because I've seen many patients, reproductive age females, who come in every month, every three months, every six months with similar pain, get a CT scan, it's described as normal or described as having a corpus luteal cyst, and they come back in with the same pain in a few months. And I think patient education can reduce radiation exposure for patients presenting with recurrent pelvic pain due to a ruptured corpus luteal cyst. Again, as with all my screencasts, I recommend the use of ACR appropriateness criteria. It does a good job breaking down what the most relevant or most indicated study is, and it gives a great literature review to help you with any diagnostic dilemma you may have with a patient presenting in a whole range of clinical scenarios. In summary, use your history and physical to narrow your differential diagnosis down to gynecologic versus non-gynecologic pathology. Make sure that you get a beta HCG or exclude pregnancy before you decide which study to use. Ultrasound is the best if you think there's gynecologic pathology and MRI can further characterize indeterminate findings. CT is the best for GI or urinary pathology in non-pregnant women, but in pregnant women, you're gonna to wanna to use MRI for GI pathology. Don't forget that you can use a CT in pregnant women, but it should really be reserved for very specific instances, most commonly unstable patients or patients in the setting of trauma. Thank you for your time.